So when we're counting on the periodic table, we're doing electron configurations, we go 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d. Why is the d one bond? Right? It's a common question in chemistry class. I want to talk about why it is and give you a little background on what's going on here. So, first thing is, they're not out of order for a one electron system. So, if we just had one electron, if we just have a hydrogen atom, then all of a sudden 4s is not before 3d. So, when we look at, you know, a, an orbital diagram like this, we have our 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, and 3d. One of the things that we don't often talk about is the fact that each of these represents one orbital, and each of them, the height represents the energy or kind of the distance, average distance between the electron and the nucleus, and all of these orbitals that are occupied all influence all the other ones. So this 3p x orbital here is being repelled by electrons in all of these other orbitals. And so the reason why this is at the specific height that it is is a combination of how much proton pull there is and how much electron repulsion there is away. And if we just had all of these blank with no electrons in them, then when we look at these 2s and 2p orbitals, we would see something that looks a little more like this. And I'm going to kind of draw this smaller side of room here. But we would have 1s, and we would have 2s, and 2p would be what we call degenerate. They would be the same in energy. And then when we get to 3s, obviously they're closer spaced. And then we get to 3p. If you're not familiar, that as, as we go up in energy levels, the energy levels become closer spaced together. In particular, this is really underselling the gap between one and two, it's quite large. So in this case, the 3D orbitals would be the same in energy as the 3S. It's not until we add in the other electrons that all of these shift and that these shift higher than these ones do. So there's something going on with the interactions between these electrons and these that causes this to end up higher in energy than this. And I also wanna tell you that they're not far off from each other. So it's not like this is way higher in energy than this. They're actually very, very, very close. And sometimes we even see them flip back and forth between which one is higher depending on a set of circumstances. Now, let's look at what the orbitals look like themselves. So here's a whole bunch of representations. This is kind of a mess of stuff, but it gets across the point when we break it down. So when we look at an S orbital in chemistry class, usually we start by saying that an S orbital is a sphere. Right? We draw a circle. But that, that is an understatement of what we're actually looking at. What we're actually looking at is a wave function, a mathematical description of the electron that looks something like this. When we square it, it looks like this, okay? Now we can make a 3D image of that and basically say this is what this wave function looks like to some degree. This is kind of a mathematical description of what the electron is doing and where it is. And so this picture solves that short a little bit. And in particular, when we go from being a 1s orbital to a 2s orbital, we just kind of draw this as being larger. It's further away from the nucleus on average. And so, but what we're not showing you is there's something else going on in that orbital state that you can only really see when you look at the mathematical function. And that is, there's a thing called a node. Node is a place where there's no electron density, which basically means this. If I pick like the center here, here's my nucleus, and I move out far, that somewhere between the nucleus and here, there's a spot where there's no electron density, and that occurs in every single direction, even if I'm moving in or out of the plane. And so there's this node there, and there's two types of nodes. So for S orbitals, we have what are called radial nodes. And a radial node is basically that there is a certain radius where in every single direction, no matter which way you go, there's a spot where there's no electron density. Okay? Now, 1s doesn't have any radial nodes. 2s has one of them. 3s has two of them. 4s has three of them, and so on and so forth. Okay. What's the other type of node? Well, the other type of node you're familiar with because you've seen what a p orbital looks like. So for a 2p orbital, we're going to have something like this. And here, this is a nodal plane. Now, this one is different. This one isn't as I move out a radius, there's a certain point where I reach no electron density. This is at a certain angle. So if I kind of start like this, I have a maximal electron density. As I rotate to this, this specific plane up and down here, there's a spot where there's an angular node. A 
as we go up in energy levels, the number of nodes increases. And as we go up in S to P to D to F, the number of angular nodes increase. So you may have seen D orbitals or F orbitals and been like, those are funny shapes. What's up with those? Here are some D orbitals here. And what you'll notice is if we look at these, that each of these has two angular nodes. So S orbitals have zero angular nodes, P orbitals have one, D orbitals have two. And then from there, as we go up, we start to see more and more radial nodes. So 2P has one angular node and zero radial. A 3P orbital would be bigger, right? So we still have this angular node, but embedded in this picture that you can't see is also a radial node. There's a certain point where if you move away a certain radius, there's zero electron density. So there's one angular, and there's one radial. So you're probably picking up on some trends here. It seems as we go from S to P to D that we're increasing in angular nodes, and as we go from energy level up, we're getting more and more radial nodes. So when we come over to the 3D, what do we have going on? So for 3D orbitals, we have two angular nodes. And based on the way the patterns work out, we have zero radial nodes. Which basically means that if we look in a direction where there's electron density, that basically our electron density just kind of goes like this. It's like at the nucleus, it's pretty much zero, and then kind of like goes in like that, to where that's kind of moving in this z direction. Okay. So if we contrast that with a 4s orbital, what we're going to find is that in the 4s orbital, we're going to have these radial nodes as we move out. We're going to have three of them. So we're going to kind of have like a peak, peak, bigger peak, and bigger peak, like something like that. And maybe that drawing is not, it's maybe a little shifted too far to the left. But here's the big idea that's important. This portion of the 4s electron state, these portions, are closer to the nucleus. And so what we have happen is that the 4s electron, even though on average it's further away from the nucleus than the 3d is, there are portions of it that are very close because of the way that these radial nodes are set up. Okay. Now, why does that matter? Well, it turns out that I'm going to go I'm going to go Bohr model here, so sorry if that offends anyone here, but kind of illustrates the point really nicely. So here's our nucleus. Let's say we're dealing with a um, boring atom, so nine protons, and here's our electrons. And when we're looking at electrons, one of the things that's really important to note is that electrons do not repel each other the same in an atom. So these electrons repel these ones differently than this one repels this one. There's a reason for that in physics. It's based on basically that these, when they repel each other, they push each other more sideways in a way that kind of cancels over time. Whereas these tend to push each other in and out. And so the kind of the big idea is that the further out you get, uh, the more repulsion you get from, from inner electrons, core electrons, and that valence electrons really don't repel each other very much. They repel each other, but they, their effects cancel. Okay, It's kind of similar to uh, if you were thinking of gravity, which is probably a little easier for us to deal with, um, but if you were like digging in the earth, right, and here's the earth, and you start here, that all these particles in the earth are all pulling you. Some of them, though, are pulling you in opposite directions in a way that kind of cancels out part of that force, okay? So net effect, though, is you're basically pulled down towards the center. Well, if you were to dig a hole, and then later you were standing somewhere like in the middle of the earth, like you're in this huge giant hole and somehow you're not burned up by, by the mantle, the core or whatever, you know, like the hot stuff that's in there. Um, now you're being pulled by some of this stuff outwards and some of this stuff sideways. And you're being pulled sideways in both directions equally and so those effects kind of cancel. And what happens is really, now you just kind of have this like inner portion that has a net impact on you. So even though there's all of the particles in the earth that are still pulling on you, they're pulling on you in a way that kind of cancels out. So likewise, when we're looking at electrons here, these electrons are going to be repelled a lot by these ones. But these electrons are not going to be repelled very much by each other. So it turns out that what happens is because these 3D electrons are don't have any angular no, or radial nodes, they're repelled more by these than these two are. And that's why we see this shift up, right? That's why we see as we add more and more electrons to this, that the 3p and the 3d, they go up in energy more than the other, than the 3s and the 4s electrons do. So the end result is, 
is that the 4s and the 3d end up at a similar you know energy state where things are kind of equal okay and that allows us to then kind of see things where we have the 4s and 3d in a similar energy level so here's the s orbital here's that angular node for a p orbital here's the two for a d orbital and then f gets into three of them so the other thing that's going to be relevant here besides all the nodes and repulsion stuff, um, is that there's also something called a pairing effect. A pairing effect. And it's said to be quantum in nature, which basically means that the rules of how electrons move cause this to be a unique type of thing. But when we're pairing electrons, that there is a, um, there's an extra repulsion when we put electrons together within the same orbital state. And sometimes that doesn't matter because there's nothing else available, and sometimes it does because there are other options. Well, when we look at 4s and 3d, because those are so similar in energy, when everything else is full, often we see that pairing electrons can be a shift where one of these becomes favorable over the other, and it's very inconsistent. In fact, so I think I have drawn over here, I have the chromium configuration, but this is the uh, this is not how we would typically write it. So 4s2, 3d4 is what I have drawn here. And you've probably been told correctly that 4s1, 3d5 is the more appropriate electron configuration for chromium, for the, for the valence electrons at least. And the difference between them is very subtle. So if I have the value here, this is a, this is a 0.96 electron volt difference between the 4s2, 3d4 configuration and the 4s1, 3d5 configuration. So when we give you an electron configuration, it's important to note that you will have chromium atoms that have these electrons doing this, and then you will have other ones where the chromium atoms where they're doing this. There'll be more of these, as long as you're not at some really weird temperature or super voltage or something. Uh, there'll be more of these. This will be the more common electron configuration. The electron configuration really is telling us what the ground state is. It's telling us the lowest energy possible for that. Um, now, 0.96 electron volts, that's not a common unit, so just to give you some context, the, the uh, difference between 1s and 2s in a hydrogen atom is, oh, I actually don't have the number, 10.2, <laughs> 10.2 electron volts. So, and that's with one proton. So you think about one proton, and obviously one to two is a big gap, but 0.96 is a pretty small amount of energy difference between these two things. And so you can expect some population of this, even at low temperatures. So, so anyway, so when you see exceptions to these, uh, it's not just chromium, it's not just copper, there's actually a whole bunch of them. It's not based on you know, having a half-filled or full shell that, that's stable. It's more about you know, uh, which, <laughs> how much, uh, how big the difference is between pairing the electrons and the energy gap between the things. And so it can matter how many protons you have, sometimes different ions that are isoelectronic will have different electron configurations. It's very inconsistent. So if you look at the uh, breakdown for these, this is, this is what uh, is commonly reported as the anomalous configurations, but if you actually run the electron configuration calculations, it's actually even more than that. These are all the ones that have different electron configurations, and you can see that it's not just a half-filled or filled subshell, and in addition to that, we have some where that's not even the case. So tungsten here, I believe 74 is tungsten, uh, is not an anomalous configuration. This would be, you know, 6s2, uh, 4f14 and then 5d4 would be the electron configuration that's most stable. So you can see that the pairing there doesn't matter uh, for the for the success electrons. And then one of these, if, oh, I feel like it was 46. This one actually has uh, the 5s shell is empty and then it's a full 40. So anyway, hope that helps. Hope that gives you a little interesting stuff about electron configurations and possibly why your teacher chose to glance over it. <laughs>